based on it. Yeah, so uh, based on written text, sorry about the jumbling of the bullet points there. And uh, most of the written history is also based on one particular variety of text, they are written in Sanskrit. And most of the checks that were written in Sanskrit under written or about computational astronomy. So we have a, a someone like a monumental work, a contribution by David Pingree, among many others, who has got this census of the exact sciences in Sanskrit. Uh, it's a uh, Goes to several volumes, and if you uh, look at this, and I did a oral history project with some other people who participated in the making of the census, and uh, they actually went out with index cards to several libraries all over the country, and then identified wherever there is Jyoti, there is Ganita, there is this thing. They looked for Jyoti Shastra and Ganita Shastra, Ganita Shastra, and then noted on everything in most of the libraries, and they looked only for Sanskrit texts. Okay. Uh, so we had a catalog of sorts which dictated the terms in which history of mathematics would be written in India for the next 40 years. And then this catalog to begin with, which took about 15 years to complete, then created an archive of scholarship that then determined what history of mathematics in India. And most of you would know that the history of mathematics in India that we are all familiar with starts with mostly with Aryabhatta. Some of them start with students who start in the 12th century BC, then you have Kamagupta, Bhaskara, Varamira, and straight to Srinivasa Ramanujam in 20th century, and that's the end of the history of Mathematics. Right? So we were wondering how did this particular practice of cataloging then created an archive of scholarship, which then shaped a particular idea of what mathematics is and was into the thing. And, uh, these hegemonic histories, uh, in our understanding, then render a particular privilege to the activities of the mind. So that at least in popular consciousness, in culture, and the general way in which you associate mathematics is that of an activity of the mind. And, uh, and this privilege, like most privilege does, is that it renders and serves a particular political function in a society where occupation is caste-based. And uh, therefore, we want to look at what are the different modes of occupation that are unique and particular to set of occupational practices, both within the realm of practice and beyond, beyond occupations. And that was the beginning point for us to build this program. And we wanted to focus on what are the several orders of abstraction in practices that were computational and mathematical. So therefore, our program was to build, uh, to build an archive and create a particular traditional scholarship where uh, there will not be any privilege that will, that will be rented to an activity of the mind or the hand, but to bring the mind and hand together uh, to reconstruct a different history of uh, mathematics. And in this, uh, three things that were very particular not to do, not to repeat the first lines of the previous scholarship, is that we will not focus on any one particular Indian language. Which, but we would like to go and look at all Indian languages. In fact, we have started with Tamil and Malayalam. We have a descriptive catalog of manuscripts in Odia. And then we would like to cover Telugu, Kannada, Gujarati, Marathi, like that. And hopefully, in the next five years, we will be able to unearth a significant corpus of material that is in the Indian languages and which are mathematical and And we would not like to focus on any one single particular practice, like that of astronomy or like that of a particular occupational practice. But you like to focus on practices to begin with at least the agrarian, the mercantile, and the bureaucratic practices in the past. And therefore, if you do that, then we have to deal with uh, the real world of practitioners. So we're talking about occupational histories, talking about computational activities that are part and parcel and integral to the routine day to day work of occupations, then you need to study practitioners and you need to bring the practitioners alive and situate them in time and place. And in that context, the texts do not become isolated fragments of a past, but they become records of practices performed by particular occupations and practitioners in time and place. And that is, at least to begin with, that is our understanding of how to do a social history of math and practice. And uh, therefore, one of the questions that we have been trying to uh, contend with is what is an archive of practice? What would be an archive of practice be? So if texts, as I said earlier, are records of practices, then texts are also product of a codification taken up by a very few people, even in the past. It's not as if everybody was involved in codification. 
codification. If text as records of practice is a product of codification undertaken by a very few people, then you are able to come across two kinds of uh, textual materials. One are mostly uh, can be considered manuals at the workplace. And we also found most of the texts that we analyzed uh, are also about pedagogic devices. And these two kinds of texts, both the manuals and the pedagogic uh, materials, open up a world of computation. And also we talk a lot about the professional virtuosity of the practitioners as they themselves represented uh, of, of their own practice. So some of the practitioners that we uh, uh, begin to work on are the architects, the carpenters, blacksmith, goldsmith, alter, coat maker, weaver, leather worker, accountant, and the school teacher. And right now, to us, uh, in order to do a social history of national practice, we think, at least in, a, uh, in the Indian context, we need to begin with the revenue accountant and the school teacher as the practitioners of mathematics and not just the astronomers. And if and we do have, uh, just to give, give an example of what we have been doing. So we have been trying to collect text on uh, sculpting. So Shilpa Sastra, you know, there is Shilpa Sengul in Tamil. About, uh, and then one of the things uh, that we are trying to do is, you know, we have an elaborate grammar, which is ritually sanctioned uh, under the tradition of Indian sculpting, where, you know, a grammar of, uh, it's mnemonic, and there is a grammar, and there is a, calculation uh, system uh, and the idea of proportions, which is central to the making of uh, symmetry in sculpture, and which is specified and they're available in the textual form. And then, but then we still go to some of the contemporary sculptors workshop where the measurement is still done by the raw coconut leaf on a different basis. Yeah, so I'll come back to that. Uh, thing. And we have found text on board building, what's called Navai Satram in Tamil, and also in Malayalam, we have found text. And, uh, what would be then the world of practice of contemporary board building? And there is a long tradition of board building that exists. And how is it that the textual material and the occupational practice relate to each other? And then how do, what is an archive of practice is a question that, has, that we have been compelled to ask. There are treatises on carpentry, but then in this particular case, we do not find material from about the 15th century on uh, carpentry. But uh, interestingly, there is a contemporary practitioner who create, who found it necessary to write a text for his vocation and occupation. And we are finding those kinds of uh, texts. And we have enormous texts on accounting. And this particular thing that we find is mercantile accounting from a Chetia family in uh, Karakudi. I mean, there are different kinds of uh, material available which some of my friends here are right now uh, archiving. And we have revenue accounting text. We have uh, this, uh, what you see is the Kanakadiharan text, and this is the Tamil uh, world of you know, computational uh, culture in Tamil. And then we have school teaching. We have uh, things like the Yenchovadi, which is part and parcel of the Thinai school thing with the pre colonial uh, India. Uh, these are you know, memory tables. So if this is the kind of practice and this is the kind of uh, textual material that's available, then how do you build an archive of practice and how do you reimagine the archives as vehicles for creating and sharing knowledge? So that is the intended purpose of the uh, program. So, so when you identify and associate practice with enough a practitioner, then one of the things that we had to confront was then the idea of the practice and the products of the practice remains unchanging. Like you all know that the Indian artisan is supposed to retain this and changing character I always have to represent compelled and choirs to represent the past and we don't know what exactly is the social uh or the ecosystem in which the indian artifact function right so we have a curious case of how some of the texts which are codified out of the workshop of the artisans continue to remain as fragment of an archive which we are still searching for it is not complete you know we have remnants of it but then uh, the products of the artisan practice is considered heritage but that heritage has nothing to do with the fragment of this archive. And, you know, how do you then, uh, you know, bring them together? Whereas the, the workshop of the artisan is not unchanging at all. It has been changing continuously. And, you know, we have, you go to Mahavlipura, we have Chinese machine tools operating to make Indian sculptures, right? So then what is it that the text manages to capture from that world of practice, you know, and what are the tools which the philologist or the historian operates with when you, have, when you find a textual purpose of the kind? You know, we have philological tools, we have, you know, uh, 
the social and economic history of this company since we for instance and we know how versification happens in relation to the mnemonic practices which were central to codification processes and that is the world which the historian engages but the changes in the workshop is only engaged by the practitioner and to which neither the historian not the world of heritage or not the world of the fragments of the archive actually engages with so if that is the case then how do you then bring together the world of practice and the world of textual material and what is an archive of practice is the question that we are trying to uh, contend with so one of the things that we are it's an experiment i think and uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is what if we make an attempt to bring the text practice and the practitioner together and what kind of resonance and dissonance is available in that exercise so what we are trying to do is uh, you take a text like the navai satram or the you know the boat building treaties or the thing and then go meet practitioners who still continue to practice the uh, occupation and then say what if i read aloud and recite the text and does it resonate at all with the practitioner who is operating within the workshop and uh, does it resonate at all and sometimes we have found i mean kamare here is already done some work and there are we are planning to do cover a lot of other practitioners and uh, sometimes just the measure resonates but not the language because they are verses so the contemporary practitioner sometimes the language resonates but not the measure at all but what resonates equally well with the system of virtues that the practitioner has shaped you know so uh, i am so and so i am a very good accountant what makes me a good accountant no those kind of virtuosity that is celebrated within this text uh, but as as it as it goes along but somewhere the the caste occupation nature of the thing kind of takes a back seat it recedes and then brings about a system of promotional virtuosity which which gives them a sense of pride and dignity and if you have to relate it back to the the component of the computational uh, activity at the workshop then how is it that we uh, reconstruct these two worlds together so so where is the text in this world and where is practice and why do we have to collect text at all if the if there is so much of dissonance between the text and the practitioner at the workshop is the person that we are and then someone like gajendra bhubadi why would he write a text now to a vocation that does not have a written textual uh, tradition such as indian carpentry or what do you do with the occupation that has no text or a blacksmithy no text available yeah leather work the no text available what do you actually do with occupation that has no text or tradition how do you create an archive of those practices such as occupation and uh, there is this curious case of the indian merchant i mean there is as we all know uh, there are mercantile histories abound you know very time historians and this thing have considered a lot of uh, but then uh, we have a huge archive be it uh, the marwari community uh, this thing other chekiar community in the south you know the banarasi uh, agarwal schools starting from over the 18th 19th centuries has left behind an enormous records of practices which historians are yet to engage with but then uh, we have the account books available even we even have a few people who can tell us how the what is the code system that works as part of the accounting we have the economic historians available who who no keep looking for traces of capitalism did it arise somewhere in india you know that that's still the question that the economic historians are looking for but then in the popular culture but there is a sense of cunning and manipulation associated with the merchant right so where do you find that practice of cunning in this archive where do you find the practice of manipulation in the archive you know but perceptions are available in culture but how do you retrieve and reconstruct the perceptions of uh, this thing can you find it in the ledger book can you find it in the chits and kundis of the chetias where is uh, where is economic historians look for capitalist traces you know uh, then how do you then reconstruct an archive where these two things can come together what is the archive that is going to uh, and therefore the larger question that we are trying to address is how do you then speak make the archive speak for the practitioner so and if historians become humble enough to accept the fact that they're just a fragment of the public and then what is the archive that the historian needs to uh, engage with and uh, and of course there is a big thing about abstraction i mean the whole idea of mathematics as an activity of the mind is also has very strong affinities with with the activities that make abstraction possible and it is this kind of a obsession with abstraction among a, a thing that has uh, also created a kind of hierarchy between the mind and the hand and if you need to subvert that hierarchy then 
what is the elements of abstraction that you can retrieve and reconstruct as a historian should do from the text and this thing. So we found in all these manuals of work like Kanakadihara in Tamil and Ganita Sara, I don't know, Lilavati Sutra in Odia and all these places, we have the procedural algorithmic and the virtuosity thing as mnemonic verses in all these texts. And uh, they are abstracting fit. They have nothing to do with the practical. In fact, some of the uh, historians of Sanskrit astronomy would kind of dismiss them very, you know, they were hara, you know, not, not mathematical enough, you know, not abstract enough. And so it was kind of a dismissal of a whole set of occupational practices. Then, you know, there is this predicament that you face. Just because they say they are not practical, then are you supposed to go and look for traces of abstraction practices that is not supposed to? I mean, how do you how do you confront that? Uh, but what we found is this: there are several orders of abstraction within these textual traditions, and we have the algorithmic, we have the procedural, which are cultivated by a particular sense of mnemonic practices based upon recollective memory, not mechanical memory, as most people mistake which is not rote memory or mechanical memory, but mnemonic uh, practices and recollective memory. That's where the virtue is not in terms of repeat after, but then to be able to recollect at a precise moment where the computation has to happen. Yeah. And that is how you, that is recollective memory, which is a very different from the reading and writing kind of literacy that we all uh, know about. And all these practices did imagine a particular public. Like the artisans, this practice with the school teachers and accountants imagine particular publics and what was the relationship that they were trying to make between the imagined public and the practice at the workshop in the school at the desk of the merchant. Yeah. So that's the. And if the orders of practice and abstraction then becomes the purview of the historian, then uh, is it possible? Is something that we are attempting to do is. Uh, through the axis of measure at the workshop, at the sculptor's workshop, at the boat maker, and this thing, can we reconstruct the practice? Because you know the axis of measure is a reconstructable, reconstructable practice. The school, the mnemonic practices, you know, some of the monastic schools still do practice a lot of mnemonic learning. And is it possible to reconstruct the mnemonic practices? Accounting, of course, the codes are reconstructable. Then is reconstruction a possible way to look at the possibility of the archives of practice? But then, uh, so far, we have all been uh, kind of forced to look at Imagine Archive with a digital platform as the only option, right? Because if there is no other kind of uh, these things. Then, what is a digital platform offer and what are the constraints? And particularly because we all know how the archive cognitively shapes the image of the activity of the practitioner. Either you make the practitioner recede into the background. Or you foreground the activity itself, but then it does that necessarily shape the cognitive image about what the what the practitioner uh, tries to do. Therefore, if the initially uh, the movement is from the fixed static text into the dialogic, and if you have to move towards reconstruction, and it can be then measured again and reset again as the in order as a way to bring the text and the practice together. So. I'll just uh, kind of showcase a particular project that we are doing. So we have taken uh, the entire South Indian inscriptions uh, from about uh, the 7th century to the 15th century, and then trying to reconstruct uh, the diversity of measurements uh, and create a historical atlas of metrology for South India. Right? So this is just to kind of say, how is it possible to explore with the digital platform yeah, thematic, spatio-temporal? Uh, visualization of change into how people measured and counted and assessed the produce and value. Right? So that is the, uh, some of you might have heard of the French Institute of Pondicherry has an amazing historical atlas of South India and we are just building that atlas on it and then adding a layer of metrology to that atlas by revamping. Uh, so we take the inscriptional corpus from about the some century and then try and map the uh, linear measures, you know, how people measure grains, how people measure land, how people measure uh, uh, gold, uh, time, and money. Right. So then we are trying to have this special temporal exercise just to kind of see what the digital platform actually offers us to do is nothing more than to zoom down in the spatial uh, thing, find a location, and then with the available information given in the inscription, you can put an image and then see look. This is the temple and this is the sculpture, but then it still doesn't reveal the practitioner, right? So I can go down to Susindram right here and then 
imagine a temple there and present how the temple looks like and then present the inscription information and what is the measurement meteorological information that's about uh, thing. or we can go and find places such as this where we find neolithic tools and uh, so you see so all these polygons that we can come up uh, is where all the south indian inscriptions for all the published inscriptions uh, the metrology. So you can zoom down in any other thing and then identify how people measured in 9th century. That measured before into the 12th century, you know, how did it change? So the idea is to visualize change, not an unchanging past. The idea is to visualize, you know, they continuously change their practices of measurement and how did it then related to the social and economic life, uh, be it in the context of big empire building or be it in the context of fragmented state making, fill up all this. Yeah, that's the idea. And uh, if then we find a lot of digital uh, platform constraints, what can the code allow and what does not the code allow is one of the major. And uh, you know, of course, we try to look at can we make it dynamic? Can we do two dimensional, three dimensional? Then the then the digital platform starts speaking to you and then say, do this, do that, do this. But then where is the where is the actual beginning question that the historian had? How do I how do I bring the practice alive? And some of the digital platform takes over and then compels us to uh, think of the dynamics in which it dictates that we should be working upon. So there is this tension between what what the digital platform can actually offer and you know how it compels us in very different directions. And uh, and but of course, uh, how do I visualize a different archive? Is that uh, we all would agree that. It's the necessity of a different history that demands a different target. If we had gone by David Pingree, then I would still be, I don't know where, but, but it is the necessity of a different history that has compelled us to create a different target, at least to reimagine the archive in a particular way. And then uh, how do we then reinvent the relationship between history and archive of practices, which is based upon a different system of values, not about the mind and the hand as two separate uh, things, but as the field of practice in itself, where the practitioner could be creative, it could be mechanical, it could be boring, you know. So there is this beautiful thing about 16th century, there is this accountant called Surya Bhuvan in 16th century Guntur, what is present there, Guntur, he writes his treatise and then he's like constantly telling his students, you know, do not contemplate on the properties of the land that you're measuring. It's not the square or the rectangle or the circle that is that's your problem. You are supposed to measure the land and measure correctly so that brothers do not kill each other and things do not be Yeah. So there is this day-to-day -day hard labor that goes into most of these occupational practices and they are caste occupations. Yeah. So if you need to contend that, and then I cannot have the hand speaking for itself and the mind speaking for in a different direction in a caste occupation, then we are constantly compelling an entire generation of young learners to catch up with this hierarchy. You know, therefore get towards mathematics or whatever. So that's, there is that, uh, there is a responsibility that as historians we have not to perpetuate this binary between the hand and the mind and make mathematics probably an activity of culture. But performance, a playful activity and a joyful activity, then how do I reconstruct that history? If that is a responsibility for the historian, then what is the possibility of justice for the young learner today not to fall into the decisions, into the fault lines of the hand and the mind, then how do we imagine this archive of practice that doesn't want entirely deal with the activity of the mind? Of the That's the question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think that I'm happy to see, happy to see this questioning of textual hegemony coming from IFP. IFP and IIT also, which the two institutions which has gone on. Going on to celebrate Saraswati Puja everywhere, 